بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدي وحبيبي ونور قلبي حب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد قال الله العلي العظيم في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أرسلنا نوحا إلى قومي أن أنذر قومك أن أنذر قومك من قبل أن يأتيهم عذاب عليم صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد in our continuation of series of discussions about our holy prophets after Adam alayhi salam there were some prophets also in between Adam alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam but many of them Quran did not mention their names as you know we have uh, so many prophets that came However, not all of them were mentioned in the Quran. The only prophet mentioned between Adam and Noah was Idris alayhi salam. Prophet Idris is the next prophet between Adam and Noah alayhi salam. As a matter of fact, some of the scholars, they believe that Idris is a father, grandfather of Prophet Noah alayhi salam. So Nuh alayhi salam is one of the children of Idris alayhi salam. And Idris also is the next prophet after Adam that Quran talks about him. And he also has his own stories that inshallah when the time comes we will talk about him into details. But Prophet Nuh alayhi salam as you know he is the first messenger Allah sent to mankind. Those who came before him the one Allah told us about and the ones Allah did not, they all are prophets, not messengers. They are Anbiya, they are not Rasul. The first Rasul is Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam, what we know about him, right? Prophet Nuh in the Quran, he is only, uh, he was mentioned in 29 surahs of the Quran. 29 surahs of the Quran, Allah talks about Nuh alayhi salam. But just his name, Nuh, is mentioned 43 times. Just the word Nuh in the Quran is mentioned 43 times. However, Nuh alayhi salam, as you know, that was not his name. Nuh was his laqab. Nuh alayhi salam, he has his own name. Now, what was his real name? There are three names that was mentioned in the history. The first one, they say his name, which was common among the many scholars, that his real name was Abdul Ghaffar. Prophet No, his real name was Abdul Ghaffar. That's one of the names that was the common among the scholars. Some scholars say, no, there is other name that he was known of too, which is Abdul Malik. That is the second name of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. The third name that was known also about Nuh alayhi salam was also Abdul A'la. So three names. One is Abdul Ghaffar, one is Abdul Malik, and one is Abdul A'la. But one common thing is that every one of those names is the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdul, 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 Al Ghaffar, Abdul, Malik, Abdul, A'la. So all of the names are the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Then the narration mentioned that he was named Noah for two reasons. Because Noah was his laqab. Actually, his name is Ghafar, Abdul Ghafar, and others. But the reason why he was called Noah, because the word Noah come from the word Nahayanuah. When somebody cries, to the point where they started mourning for the crying, it's called a Noha. That's all from the word Noha, right? We saw Noha about Ahlul Bayt. That's from that Kim. Now, Noah, they said, he cries so much for his people and their behavior, and that is why he became Noah. That's one narration. The other narration said, no, he was called Noah because he cried for himself all the time. Because he doesn't know what will happen to him Yom al Qiyamah. What will happen to him after that? So he cries so much for about himself. That is why it's called Noah. And that name took preference over his own real name. That is also Quran used that name all over the Quran. And never at one place Allah used one of his real name. Now, this Noah alayhi salam, they say his actually father. Uh, his name, Lamak. The actual his father, his real father was one of the servant of Allah, a righteous mu'mineen, who was named as known as Lamak, and some narration say no, he was known as Lamek, and also he was one of the children of Prophet Idris alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam, as you know, he was married to two women, two wives. One wife was a very bad wife. The second one was a good one. And Quran mentioned them in the Quran. Now the bad one, some narration said, he had one son from her. And he had three sons from other wife. Because you know Nuh alayhi salam, he had four sons. One of the known sons that we know a lot is about the one that is known as Canaan. The one who refused to go with his father on the boat when Nuh alayhi salam called him. And Quran talks about him and the incident that took place from that point on. But other than this son, he has another three sons. The first one is called Ham. Now this Ham, they said, he is the father of the African generation. He fathered the Africans. So any person that you see, they came from Africa, right? Their generation goes to whom? To Prophet Nuh's son, which is known as Ham. Then he had the second son, it's called Sam. Now that Sam also is the father of generation. By the way, the way, the reason I'm telling you this, because Nuh also is known as Abu al-Bashar al-Thani. The second father of humans, right? Now how did the humanity spread it from that? This is how it started. Now these three sons, one is Ham, who settled after the entire incident that happened, he settled in Africa, and then the generation from Africa came from him. Now the second one was known as Sam. They said he settled in Sharq al awsat Middle East. And not only there, it goes to all the way to Far East and some part of the Europe. So those children of those who live from Middle East and Far East, they are the children of what we call Sam. Now the third one, which is called Yafith, right? Yafith is the father of those who are the descendants of China, right? And go back to other part of the Middle East, like Iran and so on and so forth, right? Now this, these three children of Noah alayhi salam, they are the one who spread it around, around the world, and then they created this generation that we have throughout the world today. Now, Noah alayhi salam, when he first came, when Allah sent him as a messenger, because as we said, he was the first messenger and the first Ulul Azm too. Because we have a Nabi, we have Rasul, and we have Ulul Azm. Now, Nuh alayhi salam, he is the first Rasul and first Ulul Azm, meaning five chosen prophets of all the prophets. He was the first one. Now, Nuh alayhi salam, the reason why Allah sent him to his people. And by the way, no, by the geographical side, he is originally from Iraq. 
And I'm telling this because I want us to know the importance of Iraq to rule out the history. And today, you see, even today, the world, their eyes is on Iraq, not for just oil. No, Iraq has so many things to offer in the world. Historically, when you go back, many awliya and salihin, they from there. And one of them is Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And not only that, Nuh alayhi salam, his grave is there in Iraq today. Next to the grave of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamu Allah. So Nuh alayhi salam, when he came, by the time Allah sent him, the reason why he was sent by Allah is because during the time of Idris alayhi salam, people were completely in compliance and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until, before Nuh alayhi salam, things started to change. How? Because people were in respect of Salihin, good people, good prophet. And it got to the point where they started to make their statues to glorify and respect them. And what happened was, slowly, shaitan came in. Came in and started to influence them to start worshiping those times. And people started worshiping them as God. That was the reason why Allah sent him as a messenger. By the time Nuh came, there were five big idols, which Quran mentioned them. One is called Wad, one is called Suwa, one is called Yahuth, one is called Yauk, one is called Nasr. That's five of them, the major idols. All right? Now, these five, there are three things about them. Some narrations say these five idols, they were some of the grandchildren of Adam. They were very pure and people respected them so much. So, what happened? People, in order to remember them and keep their memory, they built statues of them and slowly Shaitan influenced and it made people start worshiping them as gods. That is one narration. The second narration said, no, these people, they were not a good child, what do you call children and salihin, grandchildren of Adam alayhi salam. As a matter of fact, they were other prophets that Allah sent them. One after the other, after Adam, before Nuh alayhi salam. One is called what? One is called Yahud, one is called Yahud, one is called Nasra, and then they, after they die, they make their statues, and then slowly, what happened? They started watching them. That's narration number two. Narration number three, they say, no. These idols were generated by Iblis himself. They generated them. And amazing, when you go to the history, every one of these five, they made them in different shape. And what they say, they made him in the form of a male, human being, male, figure. Right? Now, Yahud, it was made in the shape of female, human, right? The third one, Yahud, they made it in the form of a lion. And then Yahuk, they made it in the form of a horse. And the fifth one, Nasr, they made it in the form of a bird. That's five figures, male, female, lion, horse, and then a bird. And they made them as God, and this has a root until the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That these idols, they have the link until after the Prophet. Because the narration mentioned that after the flood, Allah buried them, all these five idols. But guess what? Iblis went and found them and brought them back again. And he gave it to the people. Right? And this continued until the time of Prophet Muhammad where you see there were some idols in Mecca and they also have their idols, they, they renamed them, some of them called Hubal, some of them is called Lat, some of them called Laz al Uzza. These were also part of these idols which started at the time of Nuh So at that time when they started worshipping these five idols, Allah sent Prophet Nuh to them. Ya Nuh! Tell them they shouldn't worship idols. They should worship only Allah. But what happened? No, alayhi salam, he went there the moment he started to call them. The people used to do two things. And the Quran mentioned in Surah Nu. The first one, Quran said, anytime he goes to talk to them, 
جَعَلُوا أَصَابِئَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ They take their shirt, their fingers, they put into their shirt, and then they stick into their ears. Say they do so they will not hear what Nuh says. Some of them know. When they put in their ear, the ears in their fingers, it's not enough. Quran said, show thiabahum. Then they cover their face so they don't see Nuh Alayhi Salaam. Alright? That's what they used to do to Nuh Alayhi Salaam. And amazing. Nuh, amazing. He has worked so hard. So hard. Because he lived among his people for according to the Quran, 950 years. Some narrative said, Nuh Alayhi Salaam, his life was com combined from the birth to death was 3,000 years. That you live, Nuh Alayhi Salaam, 3,000 years. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to start his preach among his people and he lived from that time till death was 950 years. Now some narrations so no, it was less. Some narrations so it was 1,490 years that he lived. Now, Nuh Alayhi Salaam, with all these actions from his people, he didn't give up. And as a matter of fact, he does this da'wah two times a day. One in the morning, one in the evening. And Quran says, Nuh alayhi salam was telling Allah, Rabbi inni da'awta qawmi laylan wa nahar. I call them at night and daytime. Wa kullama da'awtuhum. Anytime I call them, ja'alu asabi'ahum. Fi adhanihim, wa astawshaw siyabahum, wa asarru, wa astakbaru stikbahum. But they refused to listen to Nuh alayhi salam. After almost 800 years of calling. Now you just made a, make a math. Right? Now you multiply 2 by 915. That is how much Noah was calling his people. And never gave up. Until the final time where Noah and his get tired. This is a human being. Right? Now he said to Allah, Rabbi inni da'aw to qawmi laylan wa nahar falam yazidhum du'a'i illa firara Ya Allah, all these years that I've called them, my call and my preach did not increase anything but them running away from me. Then Nuh alayhi salam, he got to the breaking point which Quran mentioned in Surah Nuh Ya Allah, these people, there is no any evidence that they will believe in. Ya Allah, I now ask you to destroy them. Right? That's what they don't know. Alayhi salam made dua. Then Allah told him, Ya Nuh, I want you to make an ark. And here there are two, two narrations. Some narration said, Nuh alayhi salam, he himself was a carpenter by profession. That's his job. He's a carpenter. That was one of the job of the Prophet. And here takes me to another lesson. That an alim supposed to have another profession. Right? Nuh alayhi salam, he was a messenger, a prophet, but he has a profession too. That profession is for his daily bread. Right? He's a prophet calling people to Allah, but at the same time he has side job. All the prophets, when you look throughout the history, they never depended on being a preacher in the same. No, they have things, they have things to do. Our Prophet was a trader. He used to go to Sham and buy things. That's Rasulullah. Musa alayhi salam was a shepherd. Ibrahim al Khalil was the same thing too. Shepherd as well. And they have their jobs too. Now, Nuh alayhi salam, he was a carpenter by nature, by, by, by profession. So Allah told him, Ya Nuh, since you know how to work, now I want you to build an ark. But that's one narrative. One narrative said, No, he was not a professional. He wasn't a carpenter by profession. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel to teach him. So when he complained to Allah, to Allah to destroy them, then Allah told him, Ya no, I ask you to make an ark. Then Nuh alayhi salam said, Ya Rabbi, I don't know how to make it. I'm not, I don't know how to make an ark. So what, what should I do? Then Allah sent him Jibreel to teach him how to make an ark. Now, how long did it take? There are many narrations. The, 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 the smallest number that we have about the years 
It was 30 years it took Noah alayhi salam to build the ark. 30 years. He was working on just the ark. Some narrations say, no, it took him more than that. Some narrations say it took him 200 years. Every part of the ark was Jabrail come to tell him how to do it, where to place every wood. And what is amazing, his people, the moment he started to make an ark, and Quran says, وَكُلَّمَا مَرَّ عَلَيْهِ كَوْمٍ مِنْ كَوْمٍ سَخِرُوا مِنْ He started making fun of Nuh alayhi salam. What did they say? They say, Ya Nuh, yesterday you were preacher, and today you're captain. Yesterday you were calling Allah, 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 and today you are acting, you, you're doing this ark, for what? Some of them will even go and say, no, I think something is wrong with your brain. Because who makes an ark in the desert? Ark is supposed to be in the ocean, in the river. Right? Now you are in the desert and you're making this ark. For what reason? You started making fun of it. Is that all? No. Now to even, they took it even one step forward. So they can hurt no so bad. No, alayhi salam, when he comes and work on the ark, and the evening he goes home, then they started to use the ark as a place of their bathrooms. No, alayhi salam, he left the ark clean as he left it. By the time he comes tomorrow, there is pile of number one and number two in that bar, in that ark. <coughs> and no tells them, please don't. They wouldn't listen. And no, Allah told him, don't touch it. Just leave it the way it is. Just do your work. And no continue to do his work. Look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's miracle. And how Allah works in, own, in his own way. No alayhi salam, as much as he tells them not to, they wouldn't listen. I got to the point where no alayhi salam just was quiet. They were doing what they wanted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them the disease. Rashes on their body, on their skin. Now that rashes took them years. They could not find a medicine or any doctor to cure them. Every doctor in the sea was not able to cure them. But now look how Allah works in this way. One day one of them went to the ark of Nuh alayhi salam to use there for his bathroom. Then he slipped and ended up falling into that bathroom. And was covered with their material. He came out, he went and got washed, and you look at his skin, all the rashes is gone. What happened? Nothing. I just fall in, and everything was done. Now the next man came and said, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> now this was the medicine. He went and jumped in it. He came out. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, everything is gone. Right? The third one came, he went in. He came out, it's gone. Everything is gone. Then now they put a door. Now nobody is gonna jump in there unless you pay money to know Alayhi Salaam. <laughs> See how Allah works in his way? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants them to clean their own mess, but in his own way. Right? Now they started taking money from people to go there and clean their own mess they made. <laughs> Allah Akbar. And this is not just one. Really, what we hear Allah says. Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir is one of the samples. That's what Allah does. Allah has a power of turning everything in the way He wanted. Now who can think in his right mind that something like this can happen? Right? Now the same people who made a mess, they clean that ark from top to the bottom. And they pay money to Nuh alayhi salam. The same thing similarly between the parentheses, Prophet Ibrahim al Khalil alayhi salam, when Allah told him to go to Mecca and go build the Kaaba, no alayhi salam, the Prophet Ibrahim got there, there is nothing, it's barren. No even water to drink. Allah told him, don't worry, we take care of it. Right? No alayhi salam, Prophet Ibrahim, he left his wife and the child, Ismail, with nothing, no water, no food, which he said to Allah, Rabbi inni askantu dhurriyati biwadin. Ya Allah, I've settled my families in the land which is barren. Not even one tree completely does. In the next to your house. Right? He left 
Before he was leaving, his wife turned and said, Ya Ibrahim, where are you going? You live in us and no father, no mother, no friend, no neighbor, nothing. Ibrahim didn't answer. The second time he didn't answer. The third time, he says, the one who asked me to come here with you, he will take care of you. He left him with nothing. Right? By the time he came back, the water that they didn't have, now there is water right next to them. Not only there is water next to them, no, they were even collecting money. They were making money from that water. The, the caravans who passed by, right, they also watered there. They paid Prophet Ibrahim's wife so they can use the water they did not make, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen. Nuh alayhi salam, Allah made his people to clean their own mess in their own mess. After this, I didn't know Nuh alayhi salam who was calling them to Allah, who was teaching them, who was building the ark, but nothing happened until he finished the ark. When he first finished building the ark, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, call every hud or kulla zawjain, take everything, everybody in turn, whether it's animal or humans, everybody. When he called, a lot of people would come. They take no. It's out of his mind. No, alayhi salam told them, Allah is about to send a biggest punishment on you. So if you refuse to come with me on the ark, nobody will survive. They were laughing at No, alayhi salam. No, alayhi salam, the majority, some narration said, there were only seven people who went with No, alayhi salam. Only seven. That's it. That's one of the narration. One narration said, no, there was only 70. That's it. The rest of them, and we're talking about the entire universe, not just Iraq, no, it's the entire universe. Only seven people, or 70, the majority, they are the ones who went with them. The most of those who were in that ark were animals. Every animal on that time, they all came with Nuh alayhi salam, and they filled the entire ark. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Nuh alayhi salam, Ya yeah, Nuh, and this, by the way, before this happened, Allah made all the women of that time, they could not get pregnant. No woman, no woman at that time was able to have a baby for 40 years. No woman would be pregnant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this so that the innocent children will not be punished in that kind of punishment that Allah is about to send. Not only that, at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped sending them. Most of the rain was cut. They don't cut, they don't, they don't, they, they, they didn't used to get rain anymore like they used to before that. And not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a lot of blessings away from them. And before the punishment of Allah, Allah told Noah alayhi salam, Ya no, tell them, if they all ask Allah for forgiveness, فَقُلْ تُسْتَغْفِرُ رَبَّكُمْ Tell them to do istighfar. If they allow, if they accept to do the istighfar, Allah says, "Innahu kana gafar." Allah says, "I will forgive all of you." Your sin is sama alaykum midrah. The water that you're not getting, the rain that stopped coming, Allah says, "We will send it back." Wa yumdidkum bi amwalin wa banin. The money that is no longer among you, Allah says, "We will send the money back to you." You will have your children. The women will start having children after 40 years of no woman was able to get child. But they will miss. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Nuh alayhi salam, now take those who believe and leave them. Now only 70, according to the majority of the narration, 70 of the people were able to come. The rest of them, they refused to come. After Nuh alayhi salam entered in the ark, Nuh alayhi salam, before he started, he saw his son, Kanaan. And some narrative, he was the oldest son of Nuh alayhi salam. And he told him, Ya Bunayyar Kamman. My son, come with us. Then he said to his father, Sa'awi ila jabali ya'simuni min al -ma. I will climb on the top of the mountain and that will prevent me from being drowned. No, alayhi salam said to him, La asim al yawma min amrillahi illa man rahim. Today, nobody will be protected except the ones that Allah had mercy upon them. He said to his father, I will be protected on top of them. 
Why do you want to talk it? Quran said, فَحَالَ بَيْنَهُمَ الْمَوْجِ Then the water came and divided between them. No could not see him and he could not see his father. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told no Erkab fiha That born on it and the words that you have to start to say it before the heart moves and stop is the word Bismillah and Allah mentioned the Quran Kul Bismillahi majriha wa mursaha Inna Rabbi la ghafoor Some narration added that on top of the Bismillah there were five names that he has to add to Bismillah One was the name of Allah and then Muhammad and then Ali, and then Fatima, and Hassan, and Hussein. Is that the names that he used to call? That anytime he was the act to move, he called upon these five names, and then they move. If he wants to start, he mentioned the name, and then he starts. Now there is a one question. That the entire water that came at that time, to destroy, was it one part of the earth or was the entire universe? But there's a debate. Some people believe that no, it was one part of the earth. And that was just in Iraq and some surrounding area and not the other part of the world. But when you come to the Quran and some of the Mufassirin, they believe that no, it was the entire universe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala flooded. And the, mean, the, the reason when you look at the Quran, Allah SWT told the earth and the heaven, I said, wa kulna ya sama wa ya ard. The word ard from that word, the scholars believe that it was the entire universe. Because the name that Allah used when Allah ordered the earth to start bringing out the water, Allah used the word the ard. And the ard is the name that is used for every part of this earth. So it means the entire world was flawed. Then not only that, then Allah told the heavens also to rain as well. The heavens, you bring your water and the earth bring your water as well. So it was raining from both sides, one from the heaven and one from the earth. And the only thing that was on that planet was only the ark of Noah that was able to survive. The narration mentioned that the Noah ark went throughout the entire universe. During that rain, no place that no alayhi salam, his heart did not say, did not get to. It went throughout the earth. And it was taken, and the Quran said, فَهِيَ تَجْرِي بِهِمْ While they were in that ark, it was running with them up and down, up and down, until the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the earth and the heaven to stop the rain. But that time, no human being or any plant or anything on the planet was able to survive. And that was the first what we call adab istiqsali. Because we have two kinds of punishment. Sometimes Allah punished some people and leave the others. Sometimes Allah punished the entire nation. No people were the first people Allah ever punished from the first to the end. All the people, except those who bore the ark, Every human being was drowning. Nobody was able to survive from that punishment. And Noah alayhi salam was the first one. And that is why the narration said, after Adam, after Noah alayhi salam, and his people stopped, Iblis came to Noah and he said, Ya Noah, I came to thank you and congratulate you. And then Noah alayhi salam said, I don't need your congratulations. I don't expect anything from you. And then Shaitan said to him, because you have made my job easier. See, how is that? He said, all those people that I need to misguide, you destroy them and they're gone. No, I don't have to work on them or worry about them that much. No, alayhi salam. And then Shaitan, la'natullah alayhi, he then said to Nuh alayhi salam, but I want to I wanna give you something in return. What is it that you want to give me in return? He said, I want to teach you two things. He said, what is it? Iblis, when he was talking to Nuh alayhi salam, the narration said, Nuh didn't want to hear. Then Allah told him, Ya Nuh, listen to me. Then Nuh started to listen. What do you want to say? He says, Iyaka wal hirs, fa innaha hiya alladhi akhraja Adam min al-jannah. He said, I want to warn you. 
about hers. And hers means to be persistent on something that you will be forbidden to do. To be continuously want to do something you were told not to. I said, because that is what took Adam out of the heaven. Adam was told not to eat the tree. He was around that blessing of Allah, but when he refused, that took him out of him. See, that is one. So number two, my second lesson for you, Adam, no, he said, He said, be careful of being jealous. He said, Hasad, jealous, is the reason why I was kicked out of heaven. Because I was in heaven with the angels, right? But the moment I refused, I was jealous of Adam, and that made me to lose all that blessing of Allah. When he said this to us to Adam then Allah told no and said lesson and practice according to that teaching of Iblis. That's two lessons Adam learned from him. Now, Adam when he came to this world after the entire this flood took place, Adam and his children who were on board with him, they are the one who started the new life together. And the narration said, his children were the ones who spread it around the world. And Nuh alayhi salam, he continued his teaching. Now there are some narration mentioned that Nuh alayhi salam, he had a book also was given him. Because here's the, here's the difference between a Nabi and a Rasul. Because they say a Nabi, oh, by the way, a Nabi, we have two kinds of Nabi. There are some Nabi as the prophet who Allah gives him a message but that message is for just him and nobody else that is one there are some prophet they are prophet to receive a, a, a news from Allah because by the way when we say the word an nabi the word nabi come from the word naba and naba means great news because in arabic you have khabar and you have naba when he said Al Khabar, Miss News, but the news can be important and it can be not important. But if the word is used, Naba, that means a very important news. And that is why when you look in Surah Al Naman, the bird of Suleiman, when he came to tell Suleiman the news, he said, Wajituka min sabain binabain. I bought you. And he didn't say khabar, no, he said naba, meaning he wants Suleiman to know that he brought him the important news so he can listen to him. Right? So the word naba means a news, a but important news. So when a prophet is called nabi, because they receive important news from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they receive, there are two kinds of prophets. Some of them, when they receive the news, Allah tells them this news is for you and nobody else. And some news is to share with others. And you can see, even our prophet, he receives some news, and some news is to share with us. Some news is just for his information only. And you see that the night of Isra and Mi'raj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that when the prophet wants to Isra and Mi'raj, لَكَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَةِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى He has seen the greatest miracle of Allah. But what is it? That is for his information, that's it. We are not to be told those information, right? So that is one of the prophets, and the others know they receive the information and they have to share with others. That's Nabi. Our Rasul is different. Our Rasul is a messenger. And Nabi can be sent to a small town or group of people. But our Rasul is mainly sent to a larger group, possible the entire universe. Not only that, our Rasul also is sent. What also most likely with the new Sharia, but Nabi no, Nabi doesn't come with the new Sharia. A Rasul when he comes, he's used mostly they send to the entire universe, and also they come with the new Sharia, a new book of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right. So when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about No alayhi salam, No is one of the uh, uh, Rasul which was sent with the book. But the narration said his book was disappeared throughout the generation. He did have a book, like Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. He also had a book, but throughout the generation, he also had a book, but the book had missed. Even though Quran mentioned some of his book, but Nuh alayhi salam, he also had a book, 
for his people. But Nuh alayhi salam, the narration said, after thousands and thousands of years of living among his people, and they refused to listen to him, Nuh alayhi salam, he then left them for Allah to judge them by that punishment. But after the punishment, he also asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to punish his people with adab isti'sali, they call it. Asab, adab isti'sali, the adab that will destroy everybody at once. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised him that I will not destroy your people with adab isti'sali after that. So Nuh alayhi salam, he continues teaching after that ah, after the incident of the, uh, the flood, and then some people became believers, and some people refused to believe in Nuh alayhi salam, until Nuh alayhi salam left this wall. But he left this wall, making sure that his teaching and the teaching of Allah was ingrained to one of his sons, which inshallah in the next lesson, we will talk who was the wasi of Nuh alayhi salam, how did he left behind, and what other things happened, and where did he settle when he stopped, and how did he start the new life, after the entire flood, insha'Allah. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Yes, please. So, uh, this azab, rain and all, this happened for how long? Can you say 40 days, 60 days, or more? Yes, a good question. Now, the narration, according to uh, some of the history, they mention different names, different number of days. The least, the least that we have, some of the narrations say it lasted seven days. The rain lasted seven days. Some narrations say no, it lasted 11 days. And some narrations say no, it lasted 30 days. So there are many narrations. But the majority that I have seen was 30 days that it lasted from the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started the punishment. Yes. I read in the Old Testament, Genesis, you know, one of the chapters of the Old Testament, it said 40 days, so I was just wondering right. whether that's true or not. Right. You know, the Genesis and the Bible, they have similar stories from between us and them in the Quran. But some of the Nadeh stories have been changed a lot, mm -hmm. you know. So there are some narrations that they mentioned, yes, it's true. We have it in the Quran, and some of them is not true because changes have happened to it. Yes. Question. So as you mentioned that the shirk started after Prophet Adam and before Prophet Nuh. And the way you said it started was that the Salihin were idolized. Cool and they were they started worshiping them and considering them to be the lord uh, and the provider for them instead of allah right. so is that uh, a problem that we face even up to today that we idolize uh, salihin more than what they expect or allah expects us to do is that uh, sort of a concern when we are idealizing Salihin or even today? Um, I would say to respect and idolize the Salihin is not something bad in Islam. Actually, as a matter of fact, Islam wants us to, to respect them and honor them. However, one has to know the limits where to draw the line. Mm -hmm. That is why our Imams, alayhi salam, like Imam Radha, alayhi salam, he drew the line. He drew the line. When one of the hadith, where he says, he says, Nazihuna anir rububiyya. He said, purify us from calling us to be gods. I mean, under no circumstance, never ever say we are gods because of who we are. No. Beside that, you can say whatever you want to say. However, if we know the line that these are a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are righteous servants, because the problem is some people, when they see those fadail of the people of Salihin, then they lose their mind and try to understand where to draw the line. 
then they call them their God. Now, for example, like people who think Imam Ali salam was God. Now, if you are to start to think Imam Ali was born inside the Kaaba, Imam Ali has a father, had a mother. And we say in Surah Al Tawheed, I said, That's one of the qualities of God. That the God was never been born. No, he has a child with anybody else. Imam Ali has children. Imam Ali has a father. He has a mother. How can he become a God? Right? So the point is respecting the Imams or respecting the leaders or Salihin or the Prophet is something that Islam wants us to do. Quran does not disagree with us whether they're dead or they're alive. Now when you go to Surah Al-Kahf, Allah talks about the people of Cain. Right? After they die, the entire generation of that time, they came and they said, and Quran quote them, they said, لَنَتَّخِذَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ مَسْجِدًا We will build masjid on their domes. That's what I'm saying. And why didn't tell them this haram? So to build domes and respect the graves of the Salihin is not something that is, is, is haram in Islam. However, to know where to draw the line. For example, you can ask the Imams, you can ask the Prophet, you can ask Salihin. But you have to keep in mind that whatever I ask them and whatever they do is all coming from whom? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The power they have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Quran said about Isa alayhi salam, Allah said to us in the Quran, He said, Isa that you see, we gave him many powers. One of the power, he can bring the dead back to life. One of the power, he can also wipe the ears of death and then they start here. One of the power, Isa alayhi salam can take a clay and make it in the form of a bird and blow inside and it becomes a real flying bird. Right? But every one of these miracles, Allah says, the idni, with my permission. Allah says, all of these power that you have, Isa, is all under my permission. If we come to understand that all the powers of Imams and the Prophet, it all comes goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we are fine. So if we know where to draw the line, there is nothing wrong to idolize and respect those signs. But unfortunately, sometimes ignorance does not allow us to draw the line. So it makes us to cross the line and even think about them where they are not or describe them who they are now. Yes. Um, we have been seeing um, a practice kind of, and I've not seen it at every funeral, but some of our, uh, some of us have been taking the signatures of Charles Mormon, uh, 40 moments, um, when a person dies. Now, what I'm not understanding is, um, when somebody presented to me, now, I myself am a Gunagar, and I know that nobody is an angel, right? So the person who passed away, right. I knew them well, so I knew the, you know, kind of good and the bad. Right. So, or Allah, and Allah like, forgive everybody. But the thing is like, how can we, as just a khaki people, sign over something that he's a moment and that particular page, paper, document also goes inside the cover? I mean, that is something that I totally don't understand. Right. Um, what it is, this is, this practice is, I don't know if you understood the question. Not really. The question is, normally we often see when somebody dies, there is a request of people to write their names or signature for 40 mu'mineen, which then, and the end, at the end, they put that paper or cloth with the mayyit in the grave. So, we are also sinners. How can we bear witness for somebody who also we know he is not? Masum, he has committed the sin. So how could that be? Now, first of all, this practice, first of all, is not wajib. It's mustahab. And the reason why it's mustahab is that it's recommended for mu'minin. By the way, by the way, we have to understand this practice is not meant for everybody. If I know for sure this person is fasting. Fasik means what? A person who commits sins openly and doesn't care, right? If he drinks, he drinks openly. If he lies, he lies openly. Now, that person cannot sign that paper. Meaning, 
were looking for mu'minin who are practicing to sign their name. And then when they sign their name, as that not doesn't mean that the person is perfect. No. What we know of this person is that he's a good person. Whatever he's doing in behind what we don't know is between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want to say, Ya Allah, I know this person as a good practicing Muslim. That's my witness for him. Right? Then the narration stated that if that is done, then Allah tells those mu'mineen, I said, I know what you don't know about this man home. But because you witness for him, I take your witness and I forgive him. That is one of the wisdom behind it. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's why the Prophet they encourage us to do that. Sometimes you don't have to do it. You can even ask question mu'mineen. If you have 40 mu'mineen to bear witness that they have they know him, then yes. Even not only that, and Salat al Mayyit. Salat al Mayyit, we say something similar than that, similar to this. You know, if you if you pay attention to Salat al Mayyit, part of the dua when we make the dua for the deceased, we say, Allahumma inna la na'lamu minhu illa khayra. Allah, we don't know of him of anything bad except good. That's what we say. Right? Maybe I might know he has a shortcomings here and there. But Islam say give him benefit of doubt. Maybe he did the tawbah, I don't know. He did this. I know him he committed the sin. But do I know he, he asked Allah for forgiveness? No. Maybe he commit that sin not knowing it's a sin. That's another possibility. Right? So Islam say give him the benefit of doubt or give her the benefit of doubt to say, Allahumma inna la na'lamu minhu aw minha illa khaira wa anta a'lamu minhu min. Allah, I don't know him. Right? Whatever I know is good, is good, but you know him better than us. Allahumma in kana muhsinan fazid fi ihsan. If he's good as I know of, Allah increase that goes to him. Wa in kana musi'an. If he is, has only bad deeds that I don't know of, fatajawas al sayyidat. So the purpose is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness for that matter. Yes. Sheikh, I have a question. Yes. So was all this, uh, the kids of Adam al-Islam, uh, like considering Iraq, when this happened, because you mentioned that the flood was throughout the universe, everywhere. So the, it would be unjust for only the people who were in Iraq to have the opportunity to vote the Ark and not the others who were around. So was it that just that part of the world that was uh, populated with humans and animals? No, no, no. The question is understood that the Ark of Nuh alayhi salam, was it boarded by the people who were in Iraq at that time? Or no, there were other people also who were also boarded around the world. So they can also be protected from the flood. Because yes, now no doubt. If the warning is for the entire world, but the, the, the ark was just in Iraq, then what happened to the people who want to board and they are in another part of the world? Of course that is injustice. The answer is they said no. The opportunity of boarding the ark was for everybody in the world. As a matter of fact, according to the history, when the people of Iraq boarded the ark, the ark started moving and the rain started from that part and as he continues and he get to the other part where they need to board then they board right when they board and they finish then it started from there too and you continue until the entire universe so every human being on the planet of that time they all were given that opportunity to board the ark those who boarded they got saved and those who refused they were drowned Yes, you mentioned that there were like all the human mankind, you know, after the Prophet Nuh was from his three children, Hazrat Sam, Hazrat Ham, and Hazrat Yaqub. Oh but then, God. if there were other people on board too on that ark, they must have also had children after that. Or yeah. Now the narration stated that those who were you know, because. Inshallah, maybe in the next session, I will explain this a lot. It is very, very sad to hear this about Nuh alayhi salam. That those other than his children, those who boarded, were all older people. Aged people who could not bear children after that. So that is why the rest of this were only his children who were young and were able to have children after that. The other people were all adults. Those youth were all drowned and died. I have another question. It's not related to Hazrat Nuh. 
Yes. That you mentioned Hazrat Idris was his grandfather, and when we recently went to Iraq in Masjid Sela, Sheikh Nuru told us that Prophet Idris lives here, and I think he's alive. So would you give some lecture on that? I would like. It would be interesting to know about Prophet Idris too. No, inshallah, I think since we went through the series, we will talk about Prophet Idris as well. Yes. But Prophet Idris shortly, you know, he also called Idris from the word Dars. A Dars lesson. Right? And they call him Idris because he is the first human being to teach mankind how to read and write. Idris alayhi salam. And he has so many lessons. And by the way, he was like one of the smartest prophet too. One of the very, very smartest prophet that he had a lot of friendship. Yes, some scholars mentioned that he is, he is, by the way, is not alive, alive like us. He died, but he, they said that he was, with his intelligence, he was able to be taken to the fourth heaven. Right? But how was he taken to the fourth of Inshallah, this is a long story. But he is there now in that heaven. But not Jannah that Allah promised the Mumini. No. I mean heaven where the angels live in the fourth heaven. He is there with the angels. Right? But not in the form of human. But in the form of Ruah. Because after we die, there is now a Ruah. Not the body. So he is there living with those angels. But Prophet Idris alayhi salam also had so much lessons when inshallah when we come to talk about it i'll give you more the history about how he uh, what do you call uh, he related to prophet adam alayhi salam and which people allah sent to him uh, allah sent him to and the rest inshallah um, uh, yes. you just now mentioned that uh, every rasul brought a new sharia so my understanding was that there has been only one Sharia from Hazrat Adam, be it Jews, be it Christians, be it whoever. I mean, we actually change it as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but the Sharia, as far as Sharia is concerned, there was only one Sharia. So, what was the meaning when you said that uh, whenever there was a new Rasul, he brought, he came in with the book, you know, with the with the Khadaki book. But the thing is, like, uh, is it, it was not a new Sharia, right? No, by the way, when we say Sharia, what does it mean? Culture? <laughs> now when we say the word Sharia, is the, the word comes from the word Shara. Shara means path. No, I, I meant uh, uh, when we call Sharia, Sharia is a new religion. That's what I meant. No, no. I didn't mean... It's a way of life. No, I didn't mean a religion. When we say Sharia means way of life. Every prophet who comes, Yes, the one religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-Yawma akmal tu lakum deenakum. On the day of Ghadir, Allah said, Today I completed your religion. It's one religion. But it was given little by little until the day of Ghadir, where it, become, it became complete, that one religion. right? But Sharia means a new way of life for that particular people of that time. Every prophet or Rasul that Allah sent, whether it's Prophet Adam or Prophet Isa or Uk, bring with new Sharia, it's not a new religion. They brought the new rules and regulation how people should live under in that time. Right? That is why you see Prophet Adam alayhi salam, the way of life was different compared to Prophet Isa and Noah and so on and so forth. So Sharia means here way of life that the Prophet or Rasul brings with us. Yes. One thing that we can also uh, say about Hazrat Nuh is that Quran actually used the term Shia yes. for you know the, for the very first time for his follower right. Ibrahim. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. One of the question, one of the comment also that Prophet Nuh alayhi salam is the also one of the prophet Allah used the word Shia for him too. Yes. You know. By the way, the word Shia is mentioned in the Quran four times. You know. Unfortunately, some people. Who come came out and said there is no word Shia in the Quran. There is no why Allah ever mentioned the word Shia. No, there is. Not just in the Quran, even a hadith of Al Bayt. Not just Al Bayt, even Sunni school of thought. Right? They also mentioned that the word Shia, where did it start? So Allah mentioned that Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, Lut was what found one of his Shia. Wa inna min Shia'atihi la Ibrahim. 
that one of the Shi'is from Ibrahim is one of the Shi'is of Nuh as well. Yes. Yes, yes. One thing that really fascinates me, <coughs> if, you, if, if you look at the, the time and, and instead of uh, years that Nuh al-Islam invested, right? It, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see from one prophet to the other, like for instance Rasulullah, it's 23 years. But he's been able to manage to bring so many people towards the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? What's the logic? What's the wisdom there? Some prophets have been able to do it in a very short period of time. And some have not, yet they're prophets, yet they're infallible. It, it's just really fascinates me to think, uh, is it the people who are just stubborn more so than different times? Or is it, is it, Naudabila, is it the effectiveness of the message that was lacking by the, by the Prophet at that time? I just, it really fascinates me why the time, the time difference there. No, the answer is, no, the Prophets, of course, for sure, no Prophet is lacking the skills of teaching or preaching. Of course. All the Prophets, they are all perfect, they are all great in their teaching. But the problem is the people. You can buy a good seed from the store, right? You can be the best farmer in the world, but if the, the, the earth is dead land, what can you do? Best seed, best farmer, but dead land, what can you do? You put the seed, the way you plant any seed anywhere, but that seed in the dead land is not going to give you the result. The same seed, you take it, you put it in a, a good land, it gives you the best fruit. So the problem is the people, not the prophet or the message. Now the same thing you look, and even the life of our imams, they all face the same problem. For example, you see that Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. His time, he was able to teach and gave up more than 4,000 scholars in his, in, 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 in his own, it's what they call the university of that time. But then you come to Imam Musa al-Kadhim, who spent majority of his life in the prison. Almost, almost 22 years of his life was in prison. I've been in, in Ziyara, they call him Ya Sahib al sijin the companion of prison. Now, if you change Imam Musa al-Qadim to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq time, you will do exactly what Imam Jafar al-Sadiq did. But the people of that time was the difference. So the Imams and the Prophet, their teaching is one. But the people they encounter at that time, it was the, what makes it different. That they might be successful, they might not be successful. That is one of the things. One, but one of the things that I think is the message for us, right? Is that we have to understand that Allah said that all of these Prophets, and to different people, different results that we see, for us to learn how to react to what our people in our community. Like for example, sometimes you you can end up in a community like community of Noah. You were born and raised in a community, they're there, they don't want to do anything. You try to motivate them, it doesn't matter what you do, they don't go anywhere. That's what that's the community of Noah. Now what do you do? You just leave them? No. We just have to be patient with them. Hopefully it's maybe one person, two people watching. But now sometimes you end up being in the community different than this community. A community like the Rasulullah's community. Right? Where they were dead, you give them one injected, mashallah, they come alive. They become energ energetic, mashallah, they start active. You change them in a few months. Right? So what it means is that one has to know that which community you live and which dose you have to give and how much energy you should spend. That is also one of the messages that we get from those prophets as well. I have a very basic general question. If the answer is too long, you can do it later next time. Okay. Uh, my question is like we, you know, you've narrated a lot of stories, but there are people, the critics who, you know, of religion in general, whether it's Islam or anything, what they say is that this is like uh, record recorded history, verbal history. Yes. And if you talk about history, even today where there's internet and books and all that, sometimes you know, it's hard to say if they're authentic. So what do you say to the critics who say, well, these are just stories maybe made up by people. How do you, how do you believe that these are authentic? Right. Now, 
You know, we have two kinds of stories. Even when you read the books of stories, there is one where they tell you it's a tale. Right? And then there is one they call these are true stories. Means it didn't happen. Right? Now, the stories that we narrate from our Quran, like the Quran says, Nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al -qasas. That when we tell you the stories, we tell you the best and the true stories. That is what the Quran says. Right? So how do we know that the Quran stories is the true stories? First of all, before Quran told us those stories, Bible and Torah all those tell those stories. Right? For example, as we speak about Nuh alayhi salam, it's not just the Quranic version. You go to Bible, they have those similar stories. You go to Torah, they have similar stories too. <coughs> so it is going to be hard for Prophet Nuh and Musa and Muhammad to combine in somewhere in the room and tell lies to their people at the same time. Right? Because first of all, they didn't live at the same time. These are two individuals who lived years and years apart. Right? So it's very hard to say they all tell the lies. Yes, there might be some slight difference here and there, but the, the essence of the story is all one. So that tells us that this story is the true story. Yes. Is there any time when I have one question? <laughs> yes. And it's totally different from the topic today, but okay. I was just thinking about it. Yes. You know how, we, like, they say that um, Imam Ali salam said, teach your children three things, like um, swimming, horse riding, and uh, uh, fencing. Right. So I was thinking about in today's world. Right. So is it equivalent to teaching them riding, like driving a car and swimming and swimming? But then also like thinking about our Imam of our time. Of course, he is here in this world. Right. So what about the use of technology with Imam Zaman Alaihissalam? Like we, like children of our time, cannot think of their life without iPhones and smartphones and this technology. So, I don't, like, how does this work together? Yeah, one of the things we have to understand, when Imam Ali said those things, he didn't say this applying to us today. Sheikh, sure, what's the question? The question is, sister said that Imam Ali salam mentioned, there is a narration that they said, Imam Ali salam said, teach your children three things. One of them is teach them how to swim, and teach them how to ride a horse, and then teach them also how to uh, how to fence. Yes. So these three things that Imam Ali said. So does it apply to us that today we have to teach our children the same thing, or no? This time it's different. That we have to teach our children how to drive, how to do other things. Yes, there is no doubt that Imam Ali, when he said those things, he said those things applied to that time. This time. If you want to teach your children how to ride a horse, it's good. Nothing wrong with that. You want to teach your child how to swim, it's good. Nothing wrong with that. But we cannot think that Imam Ali said this and it has to apply to us that we have to do. This is what must have bad. If you want your child to know how to swim, it is good. It's good to teach them those things. But we should not forget that there are certain important things of the time which our children must know them. Right? For example, today, if you want to teach your child how to shoot, you say, okay, I'm not going to show you how to use, uh, what do you call it, um, the bows and, no, no, who use this anymore? You know, you go out there and say, okay, I'm going to use my bow, okay, I'm going to have a gun, all right? A pistol, he's going to take, by the time you put that hole in there, he's, you're gone, all right? So, Imam is the man, when he comes, don't think that he's going to come and say, okay, bring your bow and bring your long sword, and then we're going to run after them 10 miles before we get them and, Imam is going to come with the technology too, right? The way the same day Imam Zaman comes here, he's not going to say, okay, I'm going to ride my donkey on 495 while you drive your Mercedes, so give my way for my donkey. Okay. Imam, is, right? Imam is going to be with the technology, right? As a matter of fact, he is the leader of the technology, right? So he's not going to be somewhere different. So the same thing applies to those things as well. Thank you. Uh, You're Okay. Yes. Yeah, the, 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 question, the, the question about the, you know these things as a story is a very important question because in the Western world there is a field of study called history and it has its own methodology and has its own development and people who are trained in the Western you know civilization when it comes to history they ask where are the evidences where is the material evidence for all these stories you know how many people did it so this 
try to use the same methodology to prove whether something happened or not happened. I think it's very important to have this distinction that Quran is not a book of history like, you know, the other history of other, other. So there are no date, dates given. There are no names of the places given over there. For example, no is mentioned so many different places, except for other few, you know, who's mentioned in just one surah and the entire story is mentioned in one place. Right. Everything is, you know, it's dispersed all over the Quran. Right. So it's not a history book the way a Western scholar would, would see it. So how do we how do we address this challenge of presenting these uh, stories, historical facts, right. to a Western audience who is trained to accept history you know, using a totally different chronology. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's one of the <clears throat> big difference, I think, is to comparing Quran with the history book is absolutely like comparing, you know, apples with vegetables or any other things. Because Quran is not a historian book. As the Quran says, it says, It's a book of guidance. You cannot take history and the GPS and say, okay, I'm going to see which one is right. Right? Because GPS's job is to show you the way to get from one place to another. History is was written also by somebody about things that happened. Yes, Quran in doing so, sometimes it tells you some of the stories about some people. But the Quran is not actually the book of history. Quran is meant to be a guide. That's what Quran says. Because Hudan is a guide for the people who are looking for guidance. So to compare Quran with the history book, it's absolutely two different things. That is one. Number two, a history that we say is a man written, human being written, those books, which is always surrounded by mistake. They can forget, they can add, they can reduce. All these are possible in those books. Yeah. Versus the Quran, which is divine written, which is cannot be compared with human being. Right? And that is also one of the difference that you cannot compare what human being wrote and what human being, and what God would. Because human being, now I'll give you an example, a lot of authors, a lot of authors, I don't want to mention some of the names, they start a book written, you tell, great scholars, great historians, they start one thing, right, in the middle they contradict themselves. That's human being mind. They say something now, they forget later. That's human being right. right? And when you come to the Quran, as a divine book, you can never find something like that. So to compare a book that was written according to the human being's mind and the divine is two absolutely two different things. You cannot compare. That is true. Number three, we also have to understand that this history of the Quran or the history of those books that was written was written for two different things. Meaning the history books that we see, either it was written for telling people what we want them to know. Because history was written by people. And sometimes history is written because it's written according to what we want people to know. So there is one mindset of what is written. Yeah. Sometimes they take the facts out. Sometimes they add certain things. So they can get people to understand one way of things. Now I'll give you one of the books. When you read a lot of history, I don't want to mention the names. There are so many histories that was written. People were believing in this, that this way, and now the fact is coming out that no, what we were taught, it was completely different. Yeah. That's human being written. But the Quran was written and the Bible and Torah written all these thousands of years and the story is the same. There might be slight difference here and there, but the core is the same in all the three books. So that tells us that this book is the divine and it's not like the other book. So to compare these two, the history books written by human beings and the Quran or divine books, I think it's the big mistake to do because they are not the same. Okay, last question. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, uh, uh, I've seen Ehlul Sunnah doing after namaz, uh, they do salam on both sides. Why don't we do it? Like, uh, right after the sal uh, salam, right in there. Okay. I don't know, the question is understood. Salam. The question is after Salat, and the Sunnah, they do a Salaamu Alaikum, yes. and they turn right, and then they turn left. Why don't we do it? Okay, that's the question. Now, the answer is, and the Sunnah wal Jama'ah, when they do it, they do it because they believe that there are angels on the right and the angels on the left. 
So when you say salam, it's must have to turn right, right and then turn left. So that is why they don't. But you will be surprised that even in the Shia school of thought, we do have it too. We do have it too. Some of the maraja are recommended, right? But here's the thing, here's the thing, there's a slight difference between the two. And the Shia school of thought, you can say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Not Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum. Not like that. It's one salam, but turn and right and then turn and left. That is okay in the Shia school of thought. We have that, right? So it depends on your marja. If you check with your marja and you're okay, that's fine, why not? And by the way, these are all ta'qibat salah. It's not part of salah. Ta'qib is different, mean what you do right after salah, right? Even when we say Allah Akbar, Allah after salah, that's not part of the salah. It's the awal ta'qib of salah. Ta'qib means what you do right after salah, right? So it's not part of the salah. Because the moment you say, Assalamu alaikum, your namaz is almost done. Right? So what you do extra is not considered part of the Salah. Yes. Allah. Allah.